ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to the 20th annual reading of the Declaration of Independence at this historic 1775 meeting house in Jaffrey Center, New Hampshire. The annual reading of the Declaration of Independence is sponsored by four organizations. The Jaffrey Center Village Improvement Society, the Jaffrey Historical Society, the Selectman's Meeting House Committee, and the Jaffrey Historic District Commission. The person who welcomes you each year alternates between a representative of the Jaffrey Center Village Improvement Society and the Jaffrey Historical Society. This year, it's the turn of the Jaffrey Center Village Improvement Society to welcome you. I am Suze Campbell, president of the JCVIS, and I welcome you enthusiastically, invisible though you are to those of us who are here today. This year, July 4th, will, by necessity caused by COVID-19, be a virtual reading and a virtual celebration. Thank you to all of this year's readers, and special thanks to go to Caroline and Clay Hollister for gathering this group. Another thanks goes to Steve Jackson, who has shown great technical skill in recording and editing this patriotic event, which is to be shown on the real July 4th. I also want to thank Rob Stevenson, whose idea it was 20 years ago to start this tradition. It seems especially important this year to keep this tradition alive. Thank you, Rob. Unfortunately, the JCVIS won't be hosting you for our annual ice cream social after the reading at the horse sheds under our new roof. We look forward to an occasion there as soon as possible to celebrate all of us being together once again. We will all miss fi filling the meeting house at noon on the 4th of July and celebrating afterwards. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, that are among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. 
To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish, relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and the convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the populations of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither and raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent upon his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, or imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. For abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our legislators and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated a government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty, perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbageous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall by themselves at their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, 
and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repu repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts of their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity. And we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress, assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are of right, ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Connecticut, Samuel Huntington, Roger Sherman, William Williams, Oliver Walcott. Delaware, Thomas McKean, George Reed, Caesar Rodney. Georgia, Lyman Hall, Button Gwinnett, George Walton. Maryland, Charles Carroll, Samuel Chase, William Parker, Thomas Stone. Massachusetts, John Adams, Samuel Adams, Elbridge Jerry, John Hancock, Robert Treat Payne. New Hampshire, Josiah Bartlett, Matthew Thornton, William Whipple. New Jersey, Abraham Clark, John Hart, Francis Hopkinson, Richard Stockton, and John Witherspoon. The State of New York, William Floyd, Francis Lewis, Philip Livingston, Lewis Morris, from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, George Clymer, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Morris, John Morton, George Ross, Benjamin Rush, James Smith, George Taylor, and James Wilson. From the state of North Carolina, Joseph Hughes, William Hooper, John Penn, 
From the state of Rhode Island, William Ellery, Stephen Hopkins. From the state of South Carolina, Thomas Hayward, Jr., Thomas Lynch, Jr., Arthur Middleton, Edward Rutledge. From the Commonwealth of Virginia, Carter Braxton, Benjamin Harrison, Thomas Jefferson, Francis Lightfoot Lee, Richard Henry Lee, Thomas Nelson, Jr., and George White. This is the 20th year of this event in this beautiful place. And over those 20 years, our community has had a, a wonderful experience every 4th of July. To be in this place, to hear these beautiful words, meaningful words of our country spoken by our citizens who were in many ways very much like the people who signed this document. All people in their communities, all local trades, local professions, but citizens of their towns. They signed it, and we have people like that speaking it. Now, <clears throat> this thing doesn't just happen, this wonderful event. This happens because there is someone who has the idea and then makes it happen, and that is Rob Stevenson, right here. He had the idea 20 years ago. He put together a team to make it work, and it work it did. It's a meaningful treasure. It's a gift to the town from Rob, and we will treasure it forever. Now, I know Rob is moving to Peterborough, a questionable decision, but nonetheless, <laughs> that's where he's headed, and we hope that he will be back with us next year, making this run with us all together when this place will be full again. Be nice to have a room full of 150 people or so, which is usually what we've got, but we have our readers here all masked up, and we're going to present to Rob here a gift. It's not really the same kind of gift that he gave and gives our town, but it is something to keep him warm in the Arctic Circle where he will be residing here in town on Main Street. It's a bottle of Shackleton's very own whiskey. It's the least we can do for this man who has done so very much for our town. Thank you. Yeah, a few words, I'm sure. Well, this, this will make a great addition to my collection. I actually have a box that this came in, but I don't have a, I never had a bottle. It's too expensive, so. <laughs> I, uh, but thank you, everybody. Very unexpected. But it did happen 20 years ago, and I forgot what the inspiration was, but it's done many, in many places, but usually it's a single reader who will read the whole thing. And the idea of 20 some odd people, or 30, uh, actually we used to do more of the signers, or, or more people reading the signers, and that was shortened this year. But um, it, um, it, it was, um, we took a kind of a chance. We didn't know how many people were going to show up. There were a few spots that hadn't been taken, so we took people from the audience that morning and gave them a script. And it started, um, started that day 20 years ago. So it's, it's, it is a great event.
Thank you.